Welcome to the Higher Ed Jobs Podcast. I'm Andy Hibble, the Chief Operating Officer and one of the co-founders of Higher Ed Jobs. And I'm Kelly Sherwin, the Director of Editorial Strategy. Today, we're talking with Kathleen Hermazinski regarding job search advice and tips for new job seekers in higher ed. Thanks, Kathleen, for joining us today. Thank you both for having me. I appreciate it. Kathleen has been the head of HR at Eureka College for four and a half years and has worked at the college for seven and a half years. She was involved with Coupa HR, Wildfire, Ignite in 2022-23 and has a bachelor's degree in business administration from Robert Morris University. Kathleen has worked as a college bowling coach in Illinois and is active in national and state bowling organizations, and we just found out as a professional bowler as well. We are excited to have you today and have this conversation, Kathleen. I'm excited to be here. So today, like I said, we'll be talking about job search advice and tips for new job seekers. And I always think that people can have a refresher to who might be looking for a new opportunity. So Kathleen, from your perspective, what are the few of the top mistakes or faux pas that job seekers make? And I kind of will give you a, a part two to that. If someone does make a mistake, how can they recover from that misstep? I feel like that's a great question, especially in today's job market. There are so many individuals trying to change jobs, promotions, industries, and it depends on the the position and the institution and who you're interviewing with of what those faux pas are. So a faux pas to me might not be for someone else. So generally speaking, not asking questions in an interview is a red flag for me. That means you've probably not done any research. You aren't looking into our culture, our mission statement, or, or anything else like that. So Ending an interview with no question makes me feel like you're not prepared for the interview and you're not prepared to join my team or my institution. I would also say researching, as it kind of goes into that asking questions part, research the institution, research the correct institution. We had a high level position in our development office. It's been a number of years. Got on a, the search committee call. Um, we had another VP on the call. We had a faculty director. So it was a decent sized search committee. And from the get-go, everybody introduces themselves and the candidate says, hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm very excited to be here. And then went right into the endowment numbers of an institution, not even closely in name, geographic location or anything to us. And immediately when you looked around the room, one of my um, faculty members was just like pulling out his hair. He, it, it was, we don't know if maybe this candidate was interviewing for the same position at that institution, but researching the correct institution is going to be at the, the, probably the top of the list and, and understanding what the structure is, you know, what the, the position is so you can ask questions pertinent to that. And then the last one that I've seen here recently is since the pandemic of a faux pas, timeliness uh, on responding to recruiters and hiring managers. I think it's part of the labor market where people are interviewing for multiple positions at the same time. And then they're trying to pit and give themselves more time in between the offers, but you're losing interest at that. So um, for example, we recently had one where as the recruiter for this position, I had reached out to this candidate. I called them twice and sent two follow-up emails no response. I mark them in our applicant tracking system that, you know, they're no longer interested. That generated an email. And then they're replying back to me saying, no, no, I'm I'm interested. I'm interested. Okay. Okay. Maybe there's miscommunication. Then we bring them in for an interview and then they no show. And so right there, you know, just that timeliness and responding to emails, phone calls, and not making the institution or the recruiter wait for it, that is just going to give you a terrible first impression and talking about correcting it, we tried to correct that one and let the candidate give them a second chance. But when they no showed on that one, you know, we're, we're kind of done with that. So those are going to be some of the the top ones. And then if I can add a fourth one, yes. Assuming gender, I know DEI is really important to a lot of um, higher education institutions. And one of those is assuming gender. So at Eureka College, we have stopped saying Mr. Hibble or Mrs. Sherwin, you want to make sure we're calling them Andy and Kelly, just to make sure we're not assuming what those gender pronouns are. And then when you talk about like, oh, my boss, he, or oh, my boss, she, when you don't know what the gender is on that. So just trying to stay away, not necessarily a faux pas, but kind of maybe words of encouragement to not assume gender because we're just in that different type of society, especially in higher education. Kathleen, that was wonderful. And I think extremely thoughtful, but also comprehensive. I think that one nugget I just want to pick up on is the no-show. Like the no-show to me 
I hear of it so much more often, particularly post pandemic. And I think I want to appeal to an early stage job seeker and say two things. I think the most important thing to remember about the no show is have more pride in yourself and your candidacy to not no show. Hopefully that wasn't too many negatives there. <laughs> like professionals, no, you don't need to show up for every interview you agree with, but professionally handle that situation when you want to cancel that. Simply no showing is not taking pride in your work or your own professionalism. And if that isn't enough for you, which I hope it would be, know that the world is a very small place. And maybe you will have some interaction with somebody who knows that person who you know showed. And that is something that will stick with you. People do not take kindly to being no showed. Correct. I think that point, I'm really glad you brought that up, that I think that that has really changed over the past few years. And to follow up, I feel like it could be anxiety. We're seeing a lot more with the younger generations that there's a lot of anxiety, especially picking up a phone call. We're seeing less interactions because mainly because of the pandemic. If you think about the last four years, everybody's been kind of glued to their screens rather than in person. And so what I've seen is somebody followed up with an email like a week after they no showed and said, I'm so sorry, I was overwhelmed and my anxiety got the better of me. I don't want this position, but thanks. And it's, I don't even know if that's worse than just no call, no show that's there. So And you've mentioned it, that it's more prolific, you know, past the pandemic. And I would say that's absolutely true. My white collar jobs have had more no shows than my blue collar positions on campus, which I find to be very interesting because pre pandemic, that would have been the opposite in our trend, at least at Eureka College. That's interesting. I actually want to piggyback on the the comment you said about the no show, but then the earlier part when you said about the delay in communication And I know we're kind of focusing on like the early career job seekers. I have three teenagers. Several of us have have teenagers. And it's almost like they, well, you don't know what you don't know type thing. And I think they almost think that it's like, oh, waiting a couple of days, it's it's fine. I mean, it it very well could be to your point where the, you know, people are kind of weighing options. But um, my teenagers kind of think like, oh, a couple of days is is, is totally fine. They'll, They'll wait for me. But that's not always the case. Like you said, in those couple days, you're kind of almost writing them off saying they're not interested and we might move on to the next candidate. So for those early career job seekers, yes, communication and prompt follow-up is definitely important. So thank you for bringing that up. And actually, I just have one other question on the person that had the wrong statistics and was talking about the wrong institution. How did you guys handle that? Did you correct that person or uh, like, how do you... <laughs> The introduction that he gave was a very nice monologue, you know, so like the whole tell us about yourself, why this position, why Eureka College, right? That most interviews start that way. It was about a five minute, beautiful introduction for this other institution. And at that point, he got so far into it. We weren't comfortable. So we continued to ask our questions and we would say like, at Eureka College, it's this and the candidate never apologized or backed up or and it, they weren't our numbers. I want to be very clear, like the information he had was great, but it wasn't even close to anything that our institution was doing. So I might have been a problem on our part. We just let him continue, but still reiterated it was yeah. Eureka College within the the rest of the interview. Thank you, Kathleen, for for that wonderful insight. So moving on to, you know, the theme of early career job seekers, what is some common advice that you would give to an early career job seeker? Well, the timing of this question is perfect. I have been working with our career services department to do mock interviews for graduating seniors. One of the perks of being such a small school is we do have that one-on-one touches with our students. So mock interviews, uh, why not? Even if you're not fresh out of school um, and you're changing industries, why not sit down and maybe go through what your interview skills look like? Maybe it's been a while since you've interviewed or it's your first time interviewing professionally. Find somebody in your career services office, your HR person at your institution, a trusted friend, somebody to just kind of sit down and maybe work out some of those basic answers with. Be yourself. I feel like this is one that you hear a lot, but it's not like you hear it, but you don't hear it. And so be yourself and remember you're interviewing the institution as well. 
Um, so we want to know that you're a good fit for us and you need to be open and honest and, and what is your personality? What is your background? Like we want to make sure that we can help support you and professionally develop you for your next step after you leave our institution. Do you like us though? That's the next question is we have so many candidates that come in and want to, they tell us the answer they think we want to hear. That's not going to work out in the end. If we don't know you and you don't know us, I want this partnership. I want this employment to last and retain you for however long I can. I don't want it to end in 30, 60, 90 days because you hated it here or after a year because it wasn't a good fit. So make sure you be yourself and you're interviewing the institution as well. One big thing for me is know an industry trend for the specific position that you're going into for. So if you're hiring for HR, for example, if you're not bringing up the new Fair Labor Standard Act as part of an industry trend that's coming down, I'm going to assume that you're not up to date because that's one of the biggest trends right now in human resources. If it's business, if it's art, if it's admissions, if it's collections, you know, what is one recent topic that's been a point of discussion that you can bring up in that interview so you know, like you come across as well-informed as part of that position. And then oldie but a goodie, bring a pen and paper, whether it's the portfolio, a notebook, something. Questions that we ask in higher education are sometimes two, three, four, five part questions. And so being able to have something to write down what those questions are taking notes, you're probably going to meet at least at Eureka College, our on-campus interviews can last a few hours meeting with several different stakeholders. And you want to make sure you're able and have the capability to take down notes and stuff to use for later and ask questions, so on and so forth. So pen and paper. Yes. Very easy. I love everything you said. And I agree with everything you said. And actually, I had a former supervisor that pointed that out. She was interviewing other people and she goes, and that person did not bring a notebook and, and paper to take notes. And it irritated her so much. So that mm -hmm. is for, for real. That's, that's, that's a definite uh, yes. And I love the point about bringing in something that's a hot topic in, in the industry or related to your position. So I know earlier you said, make sure people are asking questions. So if you, as the, the college, did not give that job seeker a prompt asking them, what industry standard do you want to talk about? How and when should that person bring in their knowledge? Like, hey, I want to, I want to highlight what I know about this topic, the, the, the FAFSA or whatever it might be. How, how can they bring that in? I think you kind of mentioned it yourself in the question aspect. So if it's not been brought up, which would surprise me because I feel like that's a question that is being asked a lot is what are the industry trends. But if you're not asked that question and it gets down to the question, so you've asked your questions about culture, what's the day look like, what's the supervisory method, et cetera, then it's going to be like, I'm curious, I understand, I'm going to use my HR background here, that the Fair Labor Standard Act is having a salary threshold increase on July 1st. How is your institution handling that? So you stated what the fact is, what your knowledge is, and then asking, you know, what is the institution done, will do, you know, what are you looking for? And that way it just kind of helps bridge that gap of, yes, I know this and I'm asking you what you're doing and maybe hopefully they have an answer, but maybe not. That's great advice. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. That was excellent. Last September, you contributed to an article on higher ed jobs about the five basic mistakes that may be hurting your candidacy. And in it, you had wonderful advice and great advice about recording yourself and looking at how you present and answer interview questions. And I hope when we get to kind of like uh, additional advice questions, you speak a little bit more to that. But that article began with talking about a rejection letter and the firestorm of emotions you might have. And job search can be a very emotional roller coaster, particularly for somebody who's never gone through those emotions before. How do you recommend job seekers find ways to keep their energy and enthusiasm up during a job search process. And when those processes become longer than what the job seeker would hope for, how do you suggest a, a job seeker describe this sort of process to a potential employer in a, in a way that is absent of that emotion? Another great question and a specific to a higher education question with the three follow-up questions, I think that were on the original question. So in order to keep up energy, 
I think having a strong support system is is going to be key to that. Whether it's a spouse, a partner, um, a coworker that you trust, a, a family friend, maybe you and a couple of others are all going through and they're looking for a different job. And so to speak to the the testing, you could also do your mock interviews with the the support system as well. But being able to have somebody that you can it, job search is like Schrodinger's box to me and and stick with me while I, I have this analogy. You're in your current job. You probably have a position right now, or maybe you don't. So you, you're in that one. And then you apply for a position and you're interviewing for that position. And you kind of have that job, but you kind of don't have that job. So you kind of have both and you got to figure out what it is that you're actually looking for. So having a strong support system, somebody to go to, to talk about the elations of, of a good interview and talk about the, the disappointments of a, of a bad interview can help. But to, to reference the higher ed playlist, I think sometimes music can actually also really be very helpful in terms of just keeping energy up. But then take a deep breath and just know that you'll end up where you're meant to be it's a long process. And the reason it can be a long process is to make sure it's the right fit for you and the right fit for the institution. And so you want to be able to take your time. And I know it can be frustrating, but we want to make sure the employer and the potential employee find that right fit uh, in order follow up, follow up, follow up. If you've not heard anything, it doesn't hurt to ask. I've heard a lot of people in my life that are like, oh, I didn't hear anything back for four weeks and I'm not sure, you know, where I'm at in the process. My first reaction is, well, what did you say when you followed up or what did they say when you emailed them or called them? Oh, I didn't do that. Okay, well, let's start a conversation like they may have forgotten. You may not have the position and they just haven't updated the applicant tracking system or something else like that. So reach out to the appropriate person. So if there is like a point of contact, make sure you're reaching out to the search chair. Maybe it's the recruiter. Maybe it's the HR office. Reach out to the appropriate person and ask for an update. It could be three sentences. Hi, I hope you're doing well. I recently applied or interviewed or spoke with whoever about this position, and I'm looking for a timeline update. If they respond to you, then great. You have more of an answer. If they don't respond to you, it might be time to kind of move on and move away from that position. It wasn't a good fit overall. Is that ideal? No. As somebody in HR, I hate when that happens to others. I try to make sure it never happens at Eureka College. I want every applicant to know where they're at in that process and be as transparent as possible. But to to speak to that, it's just going to come back to the support system. They'll be able to encourage you to reach out to that employer, recruiter, or whoever it is to try to get a follow-up as well. That was fantastic. Kathleen, thank you so much for for bringing the idea of following up. Um, I think a lot of our job seekers, no matter if it's a you know a newer career job seeker or someone who has has been in higher ed for a while, questions like how and and when to follow up and what to say. And I like to to hear from the you know HR perspective that yes, it's okay to follow up. But backing up even further to the actual interview, do you have advice on how someone should should leave that interview, how they should follow up with a thank you? Is it written? Is it emailed? Is there no thank you now? Like how where does that where do the thank yous and subsequent follow ups, where does that stand today? Well, let me ask you. Um last time you did something for someone else, didn't you want to thank you? Hundred percent. I mean, I I feel like thank yous are common courtesy. Um, and, and so an email is like the very basic, I think if you have the point of contact for everybody you've met with, so if it's just the recruiter and you only have their email address, follow up with an email. If you've gone through several steps and you've met with maybe leadership or you've met with a department or you've met with multiple faculty members, you may not be able to access all of their email addresses or if you don't remember their names, it's not you know publicly available on the institution website. You know, the main point of contact which you had, you could follow up with them and say, you know, thank you so much for for having me. Could you express my gratitude to the rest of the team? However, a handwritten thank you note I literally put notes in our applicant tracking system when they send a thank you note. That's an actual handwritten one. Email, not so much, um, just because that's a little bit less grandeur, maybe. I'm not sure that's the word I want to use, but it's it's expected, but it's not expected, if that makes sense. So like I would say more of your higher level leadership, I would expect a, a thank you note. Maybe the more non-exempt positions, not as much, but again, you want to leave a a positive impression with somebody. And after you've taken their time 
you are taking someone's time in order to interview for that position. If anything, you're just thanking them for taking the time to meet with you because they didn't have to. I love that advice. It's just basic being grateful. Mm -hmm. Thank you is not that hard. <laughs> no, it's not. It's free. Unless you have to buy stamps. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> For more than 80 years, Stars and Stripes has been with you on the front lines, reporting the news and stories impacting the military community. From breaking news to providing vital resources for education services, transitioning from military life and financial guides, we will continue to be with you wherever you are. Stay up to date with the number one independent source for military news at stripes.com. So Kathleen, I know we're focusing on the early career job seekers. So you know, a lot of people haven't worked in higher ed before, and this might be their first position in higher ed, or maybe they're just switching laterally to another position. And some of the skills in the, the job posting that they're applying for, they might not necessarily have written distinctly in that job description. Like maybe they were in customer service before or whatever the role might be. So I feel like at higher ed jobs, we do get questions a lot, like how how do I use these skills, these transferable skills to apply for a new role? So what advice do you have on using your transferable skills? Well, transferable skills are exactly that. They're skills you transfer to multiple industries. So have you been a manager at a fast food restaurant before? If yes, leadership, relationship building, conflict management, communication, leading the team. You have all these different skills. If you go more broad and a high level of what the position is, you can pull down those key buzzwords of what that skill of what you've learned from it. Just because it was fast food or just because you were a coach of a travel baseball team or just because you worked in a, a bookstore or anything, it doesn't matter what you've done beforehand. You have learned skills, customer service skills, how to talk to people. Um, so go broad, go above. If you have IT knowledge, so maybe you've used Genzibar or PeopleSoft or Workday or PageUp or anything else like that, you might be moving to someone else that has like Paycor or Paycom or something that's a little bit different, but you still have worked with an HRIS or a human resource information system, or you worked with a payroll company that that transfers into that new role. Specifically for the young entering the job market, you're going to have to get creative for what those skills are. And I've referenced a mock interview already, but mock interviews can also help you figure out what those skills are as you're giving stories and examples um, with your interviewer. And it just kind of helps you figure out, yes, I do have that competency that's there. It just isn't worded exactly the way that's in the job description. And, and while I'm on it, if I can get on a soapbox for just a moment, I know statistically that men will apply for positions that they're not fully qualified for more often than women. Women tend to feel that they have to hit every box in that job description before they will apply for the position. And I just want to encourage that just because you're not meeting 100% of the job description or the, the position you're applying for doesn't mean you can't shoot your shot, as the kids would say. I love that. And also, I love the fact that you said that brought up the mock interviews and the storytelling and the examples, because I am assuming you would advise job seekers to not list, I'm a self-starter. I am dependable. I am like giving examples throughout their, their job experience of how they demonstrated those skills. And just one quick follow-up. I think so much of what we've been talking about absolutely applies to folks who are pursuing the faculty route as well as the administrative route. But in this instance, is there anything with how a first time or early career faculty member might want to think about this differently in regards to transferable skills? I feel like anytime with faculty, uh, and maybe this might just be Eureka College, we have more PhDs than we do postgrads for master's degrees. If you've gone through the educational process, even for your bachelor's, for your master's, you know, postdocs, you've had presentations, you've probably spoken in front of other students before, that right there. You've got classroom experience. It may not be as the teacher or the faculty of that classroom, but you have classroom experience that you can then take over. Public speaking, how does that translate? What is your conflict management in terms of students that come through? It could be if you're coming from K through 12, that's a really great transition. We're seeing a lot of burnout in K through 12 teachers that are trying to get into higher education because there's less parents um, to deal with and less political red tape, I think, in higher education at this point. So pull from your background. You're teaching students, where's your passion? Where's the customer service coming from? And you have to be able to tell me 
why you want to teach my Eureka College students. You know, I'm very particular about our students and our student population. What do you bring? What is your energy? What is your teaching statement and philosophy? Make sure you have one ready to go, especially if you've not been a faculty member before. DEI statements, philosophy statements, CVs, and everything are really important for that. So just pull from your background. There's almost anything you have in your background, you'll be able to pull in order to teach, right? Because you teach in your everyday life. Thank you. That That's wonderful. I think we have one final question, and it really kind of comes around what I'd like to refer to as kind of the first date of the job search process, which is the first interview. What is your best advice for people to prepare for when they're in that first interview, how they should be doing it? I think there's a lot of different advice floating out there that sometimes is applicable and sometimes is aspirational. What would you say you'd recommend people to focus on when they're looking to prepare for that first interview? There's a few things. So first, you need to be on time. And being on time does not mean be 30 minutes early. It doesn't even mean 15 minutes early these days. Because when you show up 15 minutes early to an interview, you're probably taking away 15 minutes of somebody's time that they have planned for something else. So 10 minutes, I like 10 minutes. 10 minutes doesn't seem rude for you to wait. Sometimes it's like Eureka College, we're very rural. So depending on where you're coming from, it's going to be a bit of a drive. Make sure you know the route to where you're interviewing for and how long it takes. Can you drive? Do you have to use a train or some kind of metro metro or anything to get to your institution? Make sure you have that planned out so you arrive on time, but not too early. For higher education, I feel like campus tours are typically part of most interviews, specifically for faculty. You want to think about the shoes you're going to wear. I know that's an odd one, but we have a beautiful park campus that's a bit of a hike if you want to go around and see all of our academic buildings. And I always tell candidates when they come to campus, you know, be mindful of your shoes, which brings me to the next one. Bring a bag or a pad folio or something. You know, higher education interviews, even if it's the first one, you might be handed papers, you could be handed a business card, maybe you're handed something else from a student who just happened to see you and was walking by for whatever odd reason. You don't want to just be carrying those items around in your hands and they're clunky with your keys and your wallets and phone and everything else. So so bring a bag and don't place the bag on my desk. Just put it on the floor. I, I I don't like when when somebody comes in and just assumes that they can, you know, move in on top of my desk. A drink, a cup, absolutely. That's fine. You know, keys, maybe a phone. I don't prefer a phone on my desk, but make sure we're putting it underneath your desk is preferred. Speaking of phones, have you had people look at their phones during the interview? I'm, I'm assuming this is kind of a, a do not do. <laughs> I, you know... No, I, I can't recall anybody using their phone. So um, that's okay. That's a, that's one positive thing I've got going on that they're not using their phone. But especially for those that are coming out of the mock interviews we recently did on campus, that phone was out quite a bit. So not in a real job setting I've had, but you know, it's, it's hard to disconnect from your phone and maybe even to follow up on that, put it on do not disturb or put it on silence or, or turn it off because you don't want that distraction going through because We've talked about multiple part questions in higher education. That phone goes off as they're asking the second question. You've already distracted yourself with your shiny red ball syndrome over here with your phone that you didn't turn off. So, and then I think it's just a lost art. Shake someone's hand. I think like introduce yourself, be polite, give a greeting. Hi, my name is Kathleen and I'm going to give you a firm handshake. That's a personal preference for me. I like when somebody comes in, it's intentional. That's the kind of professionality I'm looking for and a nice firm handshake on there. So I appreciate that. It's not a deal breaker for me, but I think that's just a lost art. I agree. These days. I, I appreciate the eye contact and handshake as well. To follow up just on the, on the dress, because one thing I think that is unique to higher education is the position. So most staff positions, I would say business professional slash business casual as the bare minimum, even on Zoom team virtual interviews. We've had a number of people show up in raggedy t-shirts because, you know, we're not seeing the whole body and stuff on Zoom, but I wouldn't necessarily expect the faculty member applying for fashion or art to dress business professional because that's not the industry that they live in. So like we recently have hired a, a new art professor and the outfit they came in would not be a traditional business professional outfit. 
but it was striking for the position that they were going into. And that kind of helped, I think, part of the interview process was that self-expression. So understanding the position, understanding who you're interviewing with, I think that goes into the dress code that's there. But have you ever felt bad for being overdressed or have you felt bad for being underdressed? And I would I would hope you felt bad for being underdressed rather than overdressed because you want to make that good first impression. Thank you so much, Kathleen. That was a wonderful summary of like literally if they had their portfolios out right now, you should have taken notes on that and you have a perfect checklist to prepare for that interview. We've really enjoyed having you. Thank you for being on the podcast. We hope folks who have listened have gotten as much from this discussion as we have. If you have questions for Kathleen or for the podcast, please email us at podcast at higheredjobs.com or direct message us on X at Higher Ed Careers. We'd love to hear those. We'd love to have you back and maybe send some of those questions your way and see what folks can throw at you that we haven't already. Thanks so much. Thank you. I I like to talk. So if they have questions, I'm very, very happy to answer them. (laughs) Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, Kathleen.